Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite favorite niche real estate website www.thelandgeek.com and today is really special because I was able to rope in one of the most popular bloggers in the world Paula Pant the <laughs> founder of Afford Anything a website devoted to helping people maximize their money reach financial freedom and live their wildest dreams I am pleased and honored and really excited to hear from Paula Pant. Paul, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for inviting me on. I don't know if I'm one of the most popular bloggers in the world, but... You are uh, in my book, Paul. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, because, you know, the Langy community, everyone that I think listens to this podcast really believes in the holy grail of income, passive income, mm -hmm. which I teach people how to, to get through investing in raw land. I mean, we're talking about 300% to 1,000% returns, right? Mm -hmm. However, once you start making that money, right, there's gonna be bumps along the road. You, gotta, you wanna maximize your money, right? But more importantly, like, what good is it to work 80 hours a week or 50 hours a week, whatever it is, and not be fulfilled with your, your life? So, right. you know, so tell me, how did you become the this this person that really I guess is like an expert in maximizing not just your money but your your life energy how does that happen well I'm a I'm a big believer in aligning your values with your spending and with with not just with your spending in terms of money but all of your spending in terms of how you spend your time and how you spend your income um, like give me like give me an example all right so I, back in 2008, I quit my job. I had a nine to five job before that. Uh, I quit the nine to five and I traveled for two years nonstop. Um, and I was a full time traveler. I wasn't working on the side or making any money. I was doing nothing but just cruising around the world for a couple of years, like as though I was retired. Um, and everyone said to me at the time, I would love to do that, but I can't afford it. I heard that remark over and over and over. But the, the fact of the matter was a lot of the people who were saying that earned substantially more than I did. But they thought that they couldn't afford it because they were spending all of their money on things that society said was normal. Um, they're spending their money on fancy cars or fancy houses or, or whatever it was that they were buying. And they thought that that was completely normal and then they didn't have any money left over to do the things that they really wanted to do, like travel. Interesting. Very interesting. Why, but Paul, why is that? Why are we all sort of mesmerized with the fact of having a big car and a big house and then kind of being house poor and car poor? I think it's, I think it's because a lot of people haven't taken the time to truly think about what their priorities are and find a way to align the tools that they have with the priorities that they want to match. Um, I guess that sounds a little bit esoteric, but let me put it this way. If you live your life in a way that other people think is totally normal, you graduate from college, you get a, maybe a master's degree, you get a job, you get a house, you get a car, you get uh, a white picket fence, um, you spend your money on, on gadgets and gizmos and clothing and restaurants, no one will ever question you. No one will say, oh my goodness, how can you do that? You're so rich. No one, no, just nobody will ask questions. Everybody will act like it's the most standard thing in the world. But if you, let's say, buy an apartment building or buy multiple rental properties or spend a month in Aruba or Bali or Cambodia or some exotic country, um, even though the actual cost in terms of raw dollars and cents is perhaps substantially less than what... Um, Joe Jones next door is spending 
people will suddenly start to raise eyebrows and they'll say, wait a minute, how on earth could you afford to pay cash for a rental property? Or how on earth could you afford to take that month-long trip to the Bahamas? Um, so, so I suppose that's an example. People just, some people just don't take that time and it doesn't take any time at all. It just really, they don't stop to ponder how they want to dispense their dollars. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, you know, my program is all geared towards this, right? Um, with what I call the investor's toolkit. It teaches people how to buy and sell raw land and build up a passive income. So the eventual goal being that their passive income exceeds their fixed expenses, right? Mm -hmm. now, to yes. get, yeah, now to get to that point, now it sounds simple, it's a lot of hard work, right? I mean, mm -hmm. nothing's easy. But once you get there, then you've got this, this financial freedom. But I can't tell you how many people email me, Mark, I'd love to get your course. I can't afford it. Mm. What do you, I mean, what do you say to those people? I mean, <laughs> when a person says that they can't afford something, what they're really saying is it's not a priority. It's not a priority, right? Yeah. That's functionally what they mean. Now, obviously, there are limits to that. Like, you know, I can't afford a private jet. But within reason, if a person is saying that they can't afford X or Y, what they're really saying is, I'm not willing to skip a couple of dinners out. I'm not willing to um, buy clothes from TJ Maxx rather than the shopping mall. That's what they're really saying. Right, right. So, okay, let me ask you this then, because this is one of your most popular blog posts, and I don't understand it at all. If I had a million dollars, I'd go into debt. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Uh, that was a post that, that's actually funny that you found that. That was one of the first posts I wrote when I began my blog, affordanything.com. And uh, it was a response to the fact that in, in the financial blogging community, which I, which I know very well, a lot of people have a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to debt. Uh, debt bad, debt bad. That's um, kind of dr drilled into people's heads when they start blogging about finance. And that post, if I had a million dollars, I'd go into debt meant to illustrate that leverage can be a very powerful thing. Um, and so what I did was I ran through the numbers of buying uh, a few rental properties outright in cash with a million dollars versus uh, taking that million dollars, splitting it up into multiple down payments and leveraging into several rental properties. Now, in that blog post, I showed how leveraging into several rental properties rather than buying them in cash can actually net you more money, both in the immediate term as well as in the long run. Um, of course, that being said, Mark, as I'm sure you know, uh, and as I'm sure you've talked about in, in previous podcasts and in your course, there's, there's obviously leverage is a lever. Like any tool, it can be used to build a house or to smash your thumb. Right. Uh, you know, so of course you don't want to over leverage. You don't want to go too crazy with it. But uh, but I, I put that post out there for the benefit of people who are so debt averse that they're not willing to consider even leveraging into one or two properties. You know, um, that post is is for those people. Yeah, you know, and I love that because really what you're doing and you're, what you're what you're writing about is you know don't be don't have this rigid mentality when it comes to finance, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think a lot of people, they just, like you said, we grow up hearing, don't go into debt, don't go into debt, that, that's, that's bad, that's bad. But that's not necessarily the case. It depends on what you're using it for. If you're buying, or you're, I should say you're making an investment that's going to give you a return or potential return, and there's a, you know, an excellent risk-reward ratio, well, use it, right? Mm -hmm. If it's going to be to buy an appreciating asset, let's say a car, well, I don't know. Maybe right. not, unless that car is going to get you to a, you know, somewhere that you need to be that is maximizing your time where, you know, like if I'm a surgeon, then sure, let's, let's, let's go into debt on a car. I need that car. Right. You know, it's funny that you bring up the car example because one of my other most popular blog posts on affordanything.com is called, Should You Pay Cash for a Car? And it's, it's an entire discussion, and I use myself as an example uh, of the dilemma over whether we should take $10,000 and use it to pay cash for a car or use that same $10,000 and use it to, to buy some type of an investment. Um, and so it's a 
very long, very, like, it's a very long, detailed blog post about that question. And that post has gotten, I think, almost 150 comments. It's, it just, it caught fire. So it's clearly an issue that's on a lot of people's minds that a lot of people want to know about. Right, right. So what do you think? I mean, when you, do you, is your position still the same? Should you pay cash for a car? Or should you use that money to buy something that uh, is going to get a higher return? In, in, in our case, we decided to pay cash for the car. And the reason for that is because, first of all, we're only talking about $10,000. It's not to sound flippant, but that's not a huge sum of money relative to taking out a mortgage for $400,000. Um, and so part of the reason that we decided to pay cash for a car was just because that 10000 at this point in our lives, and I should state here that I am financially free, meaning that my passive income is higher than my monthly expenses. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so at this point in my life, the just the paperwork and hassle of having to apply for a $10,000 loan, it just wasn't worth it. Even if it just took a couple of hours, I would much rather just pay cash, get it over with, and spend my brain power, because my brain power is limited too, on focusing on how to make money rather than how to super optimize every dollar. It's the same reason that I don't clip coupons. You know, I, I realize, yes, I could save some money doing that, but my, I only have a limited amount of time and, more importantly, mental energy. And so it's just a matter of where do I want to direct that mental energy. Sure, sure. Okay, so... Now, you had a plan, correct? Mm -hmm. You woke up one day and said, life's too short to be working in a cubicle or doing mm -hmm. things I don't like to do, you know, trading, you know, dollars for hours. Yes. How did, yes. That, how did that happen? And how did, who, I mean, what sort of motivated you to make this plan that you knew, okay, if I want to be financially free, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And, and you made it happen. Like, how, what was your journey? Well, I knew even before I got my, my job, I, I was a newspaper reporter up until 2008. And even before I landed that job, I'd always had the dream of traveling. Travel has always just been a huge passion for me. Um, but of course, I, I logistically couldn't. I'd graduated from college. I, like any recent college graduate, was starting from nothing. Sure. And uh, so I got a job in order to make some money and pay the bills. But while I was working, I was saving very diligently towards this goal of travel. Um, and then in 2008, I quit. I traveled for two years. I came back to the U.S. in 2010. And when I returned to the U.S., I realized I may have to get another job. And that, to me, sounded like the most horrible prospect in the world. Uh, the idea, once you've once you've had the freedom of not being under an employer for a couple of years, the notion of going back, just it just sounds terrible. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, what I've just done for the past two years has been great. I've lived off savings. But the problem with that is that those savings dwindle. And eventually they go away and then you're left with nothing. And so that was what got me thinking, all right, how can I make this sustainable? How can I create a machine that will automatically generate income while I sleep so that I will never be forced to get a job again. Brilliant. So what did you do? Um, so at that point, I did two things. One was I, I began working for myself just in order to generate enough money to pay the bills immediately. Um, so I began freelance writing, uh, online marketing, online consulting, things of that nature just for immediate day-to-day -day expenses. And then anything beyond, I lived very cheaply. Um, I, I've always been naturally frugal. And um, so as a result, I w was able to continue saving uh, that gap between what I earned and what I spent. And I took that money, that savings that I was making from my day-to-day -day work and put it towards real estate. And it started with a triplex. And um, my, my partner, Will, and I, we bought this triplex together and moved into one of the units uh, and rented out, we actually moved into one of the units with roommates and rented out the other two. So we were fully maximizing every possible square foot that we could. I love it. Okay. 
And initially, because that was our first property, we were very, as a lot of novices are, as a lot of beginners are, we were very much caught in the do-it-yourself trap where we were doing a lot of the repairs and the maintenance ourselves. We were doing all of the property management ourselves. Um, but eventually we began to scale. And so we bought, uh, I think later that year, maybe the next year, we bought our second house, which was a, a single family home. It was a foreclosure. And uh, in that house, we were still caught in the do-it-yourself loop. But at that point, we were up to four units, you know, a triplex plus a single family home. And the level of work that was required to do everything ourselves on four units was was starting to interfere with our quote unquote day jobs. Um, and so at that point, we realized, well, one or the other has to go. So uh, in in our case, we both decided that we actually, for me, like I enjoy what I do from my laptop, freelance writing. Uh, I enjoy that more than I enjoy. Um, repairing toilets or <laughs> and so I, I made the very conscious decision to make my real estate uh, career as passive as possible because my dream is not to be a full-time investor my dream is to earn a full-time living passively from my investments so that I can then spend my time doing things that are more interesting to me and for me blogging um, writing, that is a lot more interesting to me. I just, I like that better. And so, uh, so then we really concentrated on making our real estate as passive as possible. Uh, we brought on property managers. We, we hired and fired a whole long list of general contractors uh, until we finally found ones that were awesome, amazing. Um, we found great various subs, plumbers, electricians. Uh, we, you know, we, we assembled that team and uh, and then in the process of doing that, kind of alongside it, we bought. I got I got a real estate license, so I became um, a licensed real estate agent, so I could begin to search for my own properties. And then in rather quick succession, we bought houses number three, four, and five. So at this point, we're up to f seven units across five properties. Okay, and I assume they're all positively cash flowing at this point. Yes, uh, two of them we actually bought in cash. So going back to that leverage versus cash discussion, we are, although I am pro-leverage, I'm on the conservative side of pro-leverage relative to a lot of other real estate investors. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so two of the houses we bought in cash, and all of them are cash flow positive um, to the tune of at least four to 5000 a year per property. Um, and the triplex nets us about fifteen a year per property, uh, per fifteen a year for the whole u for the whole building. So um, all in all, our real estate portfolio combined. And hold on, let me let me look this up to make sure that I'm quoting it correctly. So fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. So our entire real estate portfolio combined brings us close to about forty thousand, between thirty-five to forty thousand uh, dollars in net positive cash flow per year. And because we live frugally, it's just myself and Will. We don't have any uh, children. Um, because we live frugally, that's more than enough to cover our day-to-day -day expenses. Okay, so now you're covering your everyday expenses, but then what are you doing with the rest of the money? Oh, well, um, so our, we invest quite a bit, actually. I actually have a savings rate of between 50 to 75% of all of our income. Now, that includes income that I make from my blog, from consulting, from speaking engagements, from all of that. So that's not just real estate income alone. But um, across all of our income combined, we save between 50 to 75%. And that goes into a combination of paying down the properties that we have, because remember, I am on the conservative side of pro-leverage. Uh, so it goes into a combination of paying down the properties and um, buying more properties. Fantastic. Okay, well, so from a value standpoint then, what are your three biggest values that you say, okay, this is where I, where I, this is what I value in life, and this is where I'm going to put my money? So, like, do you and... Uh, your partner travel once a year and go around the world once a year or do you say okay you know in 2015 we've saved this amount of money and we're gonna take six months off and do this 
Like how does that? Like how do you make those decisions? And how do you have the discipline to stay within those values to be that frugal and have such a high savings rate when the average American can't save anything? <laughs> well, for one thing, uh, I'm de- I definitely don't live like the average American. Like the the shirt that I'm wearing right now, I'm pretty sure that I've owned it for about, geez, probably, probably I've owned this thing since I was sixteen. Sixteen years old, Paula. <laughs> well, I guess that's a testament to the quality. Um, I tend to buy not I don't buy a lot of things, but what I do buy is high quality and durable so that I don't have to replace it very often. Um, but the the point of that is that to me personally, clothing and fashion is just not a priority, and so I don't spend money on it. Um it it's just I, and I'm not criticizing people who do if it is consciously and deliberately a high priority for you, then go ahead, spend your money on clothing. But I've, I've reflected on where that fits into my life, and fashion is just not a big priority in my life, and so I don't put my money there. Travel, on the other hand, is. And so in 2014, I, I was on the road for w- roughly one out of every three days. I was gone for uh, more than 100 days out of, out of the 365-day year. Wow, Where, where'd you go? Everywhere. Uh, I well, let's see. I've got a list. Um, uh, I can't remember it all off the top of my head, but um, let me pull it up so I can. You know, everybody always asks me that. That's like picking your favorite child, <laughs> like you're picking your favorite pet. All right. Oh, here's my t- here's my 2014 list. All right. Uh, Las Vegas, Austin, Hilton Head Island, Savannah, Georgia, New York City, San Diego, Costa Rica, Destin, Florida, Ireland, Nevada, San Diego again, New Orleans, uh, that was New Orleans for the first time that year, Austin, Texas again, then I went to Miami, and in December I was originally going to go to Hawaii, but it turns out that I'm going to go back to Las Vegas. Wow. Wow. Well, Paul, what do you say to couples? Because, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, I'm a saver. My wife loves Nordstrom and Neiman Marcus. She likes to shop. Now, if she's listening to this podcast, I love you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay, but that's, but that's what she likes. She likes nice things. Mm-hmm. Where I'm more on the side of, you know, I'd rather do things than have things. Right. So there's always a sort of built intention. Um, right. You know, let's go out for a big dinner tonight. Well, do we have to go out for a big dinner? Let's cook. Um, it's like, oh, come on, live a little. You, you only live once kind of thing. And so there's always this ongoing tension. And what, how, do you, how do you kind of reconcile that or help people reconcile that? So what I recommend doing, and I, I refer to this as the easiest budget ever, is to skim your savings off the top and then just go wild with the rest. Skim so, your savings off the top and then go wild with the rest. Exactly. Exactly. So first, decide what savings rate you want. Let's say that you decide that you want to save 20% of your income. The moment you get paid, yank that off the top right away and then, and then go nuts with the rest, totally guilt free because you know that you've already shoveled away those savings. So if in the remaining 80% of your income, you have enough money to, to shop at a fancy clothing store or go out to dinner or whatever it is that you want to do, Go do it and don't think twice about it. Okay, that's great. So that's that's actually exactly what Will and I do, but we just do it with a higher percentage. We we do it with somewhere between fifty to seventy five percent, and then the remaining money that's left over, we don't budget it at all. We spend it on whatever we want because we know that we're saving a minimum of fifty percent of our income. So if we want to drop a hundred dollars on a fancy dinner, um, or or five hundred dollars on plane tickets to new york or, or new orleans or las vegas we don't think twice okay that's great so so you're not using any mental bandwidth at all there's really no sort of you know wringing of the hands going back and forth checking kayak doing this doing that when you're making any kind of purchase because you're you've already saved the money for the month you can yeah. just do what you want like you you don't have to go through that that mental checklist if you will like should i do it should i not do it yeah yeah exactly we just we make it as 
as easy as possible by automating the whole thing. Because passive, in, I mean, f- and for people who are interested in passive income, I think that the, the, the rule applies. The more passive something is, the more awesome. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's true of passive income, like income that just comes in while you sleep. But that's also true of passive, a passive saving strategy. Um, I don't think about saving my money. It just happens automatically. Right. And then one day after several months go by, you check your account and you're like, hey, that's interesting. I've just built up $70,000. What should I do with it? Hmm. I guess I could make a gigantic payment towards one of my mortgages. Or I could go buy a house in cash. Or I can max out every retirement account, SEP IRA, uh, traditional IRA, HSA. I can max them all out in one big go. Yeah, I mean, December must be a fun time of year for you. (laughs) (laughs) Really, really, January is the fun time of year because that's when typically what I'll do is uh, by December, I've got enough money to max out every retirement account for the following year. So between me and Will, that's uh, that's, uh, two 401ks, two IRAs, two HSAs. So I've got all the money set aside for every tax advantage retirement account and then it's all just sitting there in December, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm so antsy. Why is this all in cash? And then January hits, and I'm like, yes, I get to put this in the market. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I mean, that's really admirable. So this is the point in the podcast now that I absolutely love, especially with new guests, because I get to put you on the spot, and I get mm-hmm. to ask you, what is your tip of the week? What is a, you know, a resource or something that – the listeners can go and implement right away mm-hmm. that that you recommend and that will benefit them in, in their lives. Sure. Do you want it to be related to budgeting or real estate? What what arena should this be around? Whatever you think, you know, you, you know, would, okay. would, would you know, hey, uh, you know, your mom calls you, Paula, uh-huh. what's your tip of the week? All right, all right. What what can I I do to 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 improve my life? (laughs) So, if you go to affordanything.com, okay, there's a blog post recently published called "Take the One Percent Challenge." Oh, and this is my my call to action, my call to arms for anyone who's having a hard time saving, uh, or who wants to save more than they currently are. And this one percent challenge says. In January of the, the new year, or b- really any time, I mean, people, you can pick a new year because New Year's resolution, but th- next month, whatever that next month is, save one additional percent of your income beyond what you're currently saving. So if you currently save zero, save 1%. If you currently save 5% of your income, s- save 6%. Um, so next month, save one extra percent. The following month, save one more percent. The month after that, save one more percent. And so after a year of doing this, you'll have increased your savings rate by 12%. Phenomenal. I love it. I love it. Now, I'm going to ask you another quick question. Uh-huh. Where do you recommend I save that money? I mean, I'm at Bank of America. It's like 0.04% mm. or, or something so ridiculous. Every- so I put it on like Capital One 360, but then I started doing some research, and then I was at like 0.75%, and there's one at like 1%. Yeah. So, so, uh, Everbank, um, and I, I, I discuss it at length on, on that same blog post. Um, Everbank is a very high yield, um, relative to savings accounts. That's where you get the highest yields because they, first of all, they, at the current time, they're giving a 1%, um, return. And more importantly, they take what's called the top 5% pledge which means that no matter how savings yields fluctuate in the future, they will always be in the top 5% relative to all other banking institutions, financial, major financial institutions. So you know that no matter how interest rates change in the months and years to come, you can reliably have your money in a bank that's within the top 5% of yields. All right. That's a phenomenal tip. Everbank.com. Yes. And if you, if you go to my website, um, I have a 
I'm I'm a bit of a geek. I'm a bit of a nerd. So I like doing breakdowns and analyses and, and things like that. So you can see that all there. I had a there's another blog post on there um, called it's does a monkey throwing darts beat the market? <laughs> right, and right. I literally blindfold myself, throw darts at a list of stocks and invest in the ones that I hit. And uh, and then I put a bunch of money into an Everbank account and I see how the two compare. And so if you uh, go to affordanything.com, you'll, you'll see that entire breakdown as well. I'm going to read that post as soon as we hang up. I'm really, I'm really <laughs> excited to read that. Well, it, It's pretty cool. I've even got the YouTube video of myself blindfolded throwing darts at a list of stocks. This is awesome. Well, listen, <laughs> I'm, my tip of the week is for everybody to go to affordanything.com. Learn more about Paula. She's got tons of free resources in there. Um, and really, if you're listening to this podcast, I know for a fact passive income is near and dear to your heart. And the fact that uh, land investing, you know, and Paul, I, I don't know if you know about this, but, you know, I, I help people invest in land without uh, renters, renovations, or repairs, uh, or, or rodents. So it's... it's <laughs> It's very it's a it's a simple method using raw land, and um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just a, it's a it's a perfect mix for the land geek community to maximize their time, maximize their money, and uh, their knowledge about really getting to the next level, not just financially, but also, you know, aligning your values with spending your money. And uh, Paul Pan, are we good? Yeah, yeah. Th- thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. Are you going to come back? Because this, of is, course. Such, this is a huge topic. There, there's so much more to talk about. And now, now that I'm looking at some of your other blog posts, like the Airbnb experiment, like there's just so much to talk about, Paul. <laughs> you got to come back. Sure, sure. I'd love to. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I want to uh, remind all the listeners: go to www.thelandgeek.com. And download for free the Passive Income Blueprints. Get the ebook How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes. And, of course, get this always informative and engaging podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. And, look, give me some love. If you're looking to acquire some wholesale land, go to FrontierPropertiesUSA.com. I've got stuff there as well. And, you know, give myself and Paul a little love. Leave a comment on iTunes. Let us know how we're doing. And, uh... You know, from myself and for Paul Pan, I want to thank everyone for listening. And uh, Paul, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, hope to see you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.